Welcome to CMES Conversations, a series of interviews with leading scholars and thinkers hosted by the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Denver. Today, Associate Professor Nader Hashmi speaks with Abdullah al Aryan, Assistant Professor of History at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service in Qatar. He is the author of Answering the Call, Popular Islamic Activism in Sadat's Egypt, and co-edits Jadaliya's Critical Currents in Islam page. In the fall of 2014, al Aryan was a visiting scholar at the University of Denver's Center for Middle East Studies. Thank you for watching this episode of CMES Conversations. Abdullah, I'd like to thank you for um, being here for this interview, and, and I'd like to begin by saying it's been a pleasure having you as a visiting scholar with our Center for Middle East Studies. Um, you're the author of forthcoming occasional paper for our um, Center for Middle East Studies that deals with the future of the Muslim Brotherhood. What lessons can um, we sort of learn from the history of the Muslim Brotherhood, which you've studied, that can perhaps give insight on um, where the Muslim Brotherhood is going to go from here um, based on the, the lessons to be learned from the post-Mubarak sort of um, democracy phase that, that tragically came to an end last summer? Yeah, well, the, the Muslim Brotherhood experienced a severe bout of repression going back to the 1950s when the organization was not only banned and dismantled, mm -hmm. but its leaders were imprisoned. Some of them were executed. Many went into exile. Mm -hmm. um, all of the major institutions of the organization were, were dismantled at that point. Its mm -hmm. assets were taken. Um, and in that sense, we see dramatic parallels between the, the experience mm -hmm. of the 1950s and what's happened um, in the post-coup era in Egypt after the summer of 2013. Um, I think there are some substantial differences. For one thing, the Muslim Brotherhood today has a much more intricate network of social welfare institutions that have also been targeted in such a way that was not uh, previously possible by the regime, that it's gone beyond the kind of inner circle of the leadership and membership of the organizations to affect even its, its mo sympathizers, supporters, family members, things along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, and secondly, the organization has been more public in its presence within Egyptian society in such a way that, that simply wasn't mm -hmm. the case going back uh, to the earlier period. Mm -hmm. And I think that has actually made the repression far more effective in mm -hmm. terms of its ability to not only repress, mm -hmm. again, the actions and, and, and mm -hmm. the institutions of the organization, mm -hmm. but even the very thought that, that these networks and linkages of communication could even remain mm -hmm. withstanding. And as a result, we've seen um, a kind of incongruence in terms of how the organization has been able to sustain itself mm -hmm. Uh, develop kind of communication abilities to to maintain its uh, mm -hmm. network of supporters in spite of this this mm -hmm. kind of climate um, has proven far far more challenging mm -hmm. and we've seen it with the number of contradictory statements coming out from different places right. we've seen it with the lack of coordination mm -hmm. uh, with most of the uh, activism in uh, the aftermath of the coup mm -hmm. and can you give us a sense of the different sort of debates that have begin begun to emerge uh, among supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood in terms of, you know, wh where they go from here, what the lessons are to be learned. What's the sort of the range of perspectives that you're hearing from uh, supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood based on what they've published and said so far? Well, one of the things we're seeing is that a group primarily made up of a number of young people within mm -hmm. the organization, many of them are in exile, but not all of them, mm -hmm. uh, who are part of the Muslim Brotherhood's kind of youth wing, so to speak, mm -hmm. and who have uh, seen the experience of the last three years, mm -hmm. specifically in this kind of revolutionary moment that comes about after Mubarak's removal. Mm -hmm. And they perceive that the Brotherhood as an organization made a number of very critical errors, mm -hmm. fatal errors mm -hmm. perhaps, um, in their handling of this kind of revolutionary opening mm -hmm. that allowed the organization to be a part of a uh, emerging democratic political process that mm -hmm. was still very much in transition, that was still very mm -hmm. much reliant on old state institutions that were, were relics of that kind of authoritarian mm -hmm. order. Mm -hmm. The military, of course, being the kind of uh, you know power in charge, the judiciary who continued to kind of issue counter-revolutionary rulings mm -hmm. throughout that period. And they, and, and again, the Muslim Brotherhood being kind of in that, in that moment, mm -hmm. uh, found itself um, in a position where they could have kind of gone along with these kinds of decisions and the kinds of things that were happening, um, or to side with the revolutionaries by rejecting the transition, mm -hmm. rejecting the kind of rules of the mm -hmm. game that were developing at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, and the leadership failed to do that. They decided right. that, that they would rather take advantage of that opening. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is one of the main critiques coming right. from this youth movement, is to yeah. say that we should have actually stuck to a revolutionary platform right. Um, even when we made these kind of democratic gains, it should have been far more inclusive. Um, it should have been far more respective of the demands of the revolutionaries to mm -hmm. whom they, they credit with mm -hmm. essentially creating this kind of opening in the first mm -hmm. place. Um, and although this is, this is not, at this stage at least, representative of a majority of the Brotherhood, it's certainly mm -hmm. a very vocal wing of the organization. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it hasn't yet reached the upper echelons of the movement, but at the same time, we have to keep in mind that most of the leadership is either imprisoned or in exile, right. and so there, there hasn't been a coherent, unified voice coming mm -hmm. from the leadership either. Mm -hmm. We've only heard um, passive rejections of this kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. The Brotherhood, of course, being targeted as, as severely as it has, mm -hmm. has led to a very defensive posture on the part of much of the leadership. Right. Um, and as a result, you see two very contradictory stances currently that are playing out in, yeah. in this kind of a climate. Yeah. Um, is there any hope that this sort of more uh, sophisticated um, cosmopolitan, as you sort of hint in your paper, um, youth wing of the Muslim Brotherhood actually has uh, a chance or an opportunity to influence the senior leadership and direction of the, the party? Because I get a sense, at least during the post-Mubarak democratization phase, that there was all these youth movements that were active, mm -hmm. but they were on one side of the debate and then you had the senior leadership just pursuing a much more cautious conservative line and the two worlds really didn't meet. Um, and that really speaks to, I guess, the inner sort of decision-making sort of process within the Muslim Brotherhood, mm -hmm. that unless that, I guess, expands to incorporate more youth voices, there's a, there's a different, I guess, you know, um, more democratic decision-making process, mm -hmm. that my own sense is that, you know, the youth wing can say whatever they want, it's not going to translate into change in policy in the Muslim Brotherhood because of the structure of power within the organization. Would you agree with that? Well, I think, first of all, I would say that there's actually a long legacy of this, that this yeah. is not something that, that has only emerged in the last three years. Right. If we go all the way back to the early 1980s, from the moment that that original youth movement of the 1970s mm -hmm. uh, comes into the organization, that they're mm -hmm. already bringing this kind of spirit of greater inclusion, greater mm -hmm. engagement with the broader Egyptian mm -hmm. society that goes against the leadership's position of being far more disengaged, withdrawn, suspicious of the state, but also suspicious of society right. or parts of society that are not actively part of the Muslim Brotherhood's mm -hmm. movement. Um, and in that sense, that tension has existed for going on four decades mm -hmm. now um, in such a way that I think it's, it's manifested in a number of important splits. We see it in the 1990s with the emergence of the Wasat Party. Mm -hmm. We see it after Mubarak's removal with Abdel Minan Abdel Futuh and others who decide they'd rather actually pursue mm -hmm. their political aspirations mm -hmm. completely independently mm -hmm. of the Muslim Brotherhood because they don't want to be da bound by that, mm -hmm. uh, by those kinds of, of um, constraints that you're referring to. Mm -hmm. um, and in that sense, I think that this is part of a much longer trajectory. But I do think that there is recognition within certain circles um, that you know this could be a kind of opening in which they almost have no choice but right. to recognize the fact that if there is a critical mass that is mm -hmm. beginning to emerge. Mm -hmm. And again, keep in mind that the Brotherhood Youth Wing now are people who kind of stuck with the organization in mm -hmm. spite of right. all of these other kind of um, people leaving. Mm -hmm. And so none of them joined Abu Futuh's campaign, for instance. They decided to support Morsi. Right. So many of them are very firmly committed. And so right. if you're, you're base that has withstood all of these other opportunities mm -hmm. to leave is now beginning to kind of erode mm -hmm. uh, and, and voice this level of, of discontent and mm -hmm. dissent. That could be a signal for uh, exactly the kind of thing that would lead to certain reforms. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it, it's, it would take a kind of crisis moment as we're seeing mm -hmm. unfolding now in which mm -hmm. there is an absence of centralized leadership. Mm -hmm. There are people who uh, are destined to probably to spend many years in prison given mm -hmm. the current kind of climate, mm -hmm. which is going to lead to the emergence of third and fourth level mm -hmm. leaders to becoming more senior mm -hmm. um, and in a position to actually enact these kinds of reforms in the absence of any real strong or unified mm -hmm. opposition. In your paper, you talk about this concept that I have not heard of before, but you sort of suggest this could be an emerging trend or trajectory for the Muslim Brotherhood, mm -hmm. and you term it cosmopolitan Islamism. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that term? Well, by cosmopolitan Islamism, I'm referring to a ongoing debate that's been part of people who study political Islamic movements broadly for the last three or four decades. Um, we, at various moments in time, have heard of this term post-Islamism, mm -hmm. right? So this idea that the Islamist movements have essentially failed, mm -hmm. uh, that people are kind of starting to reject this, mm -hmm. not in the same way that they did perhaps in the earlier part of the 20th century when you know, Islamist movements also kind of experienced a very brief uh, ascent and descent as well mm -hmm. um, in favor of Arab nationalism and, and mm -hmm. other kinds of non-religious ideologies that became pervasive within you know, the entire uh, Middle East region at that point. Uh, but in fact, what we're seeing now, I think, is the emergence of um, internal disputes and debates and discussions about mm -hmm. the, the way forward as far as political Islam mm -hmm. as a project. Mm -hmm. and, and it's taking on a very different shape depending on Things like you know local socioeconomic conditions, mm -hmm. uh, political situations within a number of mm -hmm. the different countries and cases that we look at, um, and in addition to that, what we see is uh, 
emergence internally within a number of these movements of a desire to try and uh, create a far more populist or perhaps even accessible mm -hmm. version of political Islam mm -hmm. that is going to be um, applicable in a kind of modern state project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there's not a sense that they're rejecting any institutions of the state. Mm -hmm. From what we've seen in Tunisia, mm -hmm. in Egypt, in a number of these different cases, mm -hmm. they're, they're more than willing and more than happy to accept the modern state mm -hmm. as it exists, mm -hmm. and instead are looking to Islam as simply a frame of reference. Mm -hmm. They're looking at it as a place from which they can derive previous, not necessarily the rulings of the Sharia, but even just the, the, the basic um, intentionality behind the Sharia, mm -hmm. the purpose or the guidelines behind mm -hmm. a sort of ethical system of laws. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that sense, it's far more cosmopolitan in the sense that it's, it's far more willing to adapt mm -hmm. to the changing conditions that we've seen um, within these kind of modern uh, Muslim societies and, and far more in keeping with the kind of civic identity of the state, mm -hmm. with the nationalist aspirations mm -hmm. um, that, that a number of these societies have held in terms of not necessarily you know, building towards some sort of pan-Islamist project as right. we've heard many times before. Um, okay, final question about the Muslim Brotherhood and the future of the Muslim Brotherhood based on the recent experience. It would make perfect sense to me that a good uh, um, segment of the Muslim Brotherhood support system, mm -hmm. people who supported the Muslim Brotherhood, would understandably and predictably be deeply radicalized by virtue of um, uh, the, the July 2013 coup d'etat. Mm -hmm. In other words, democratic space has been shut down. Um, the prospects for dem democratization have been proven to be at least a failure for this historical moment. And so that would, you know, seem to suggest that the radical sort of violent uh, voice or position that was once very popular in the Middle East in Egypt in the 1970s would gain a greater currency. In other words, the, it would make perfect sense to me if you were to see increasing numbers of young Egyptians giving up on Egypt and looking to an ISIS narrative as perhaps an option for political change given the, the absence of, um, you know, internal possibilities for democratic and peaceful change. Is there any indication, that based on your study of Egypt, that you were seeing or have seen within the last year and a half since the coup d'etat, um, that type of radicalization taking place within e Egyptian society? Well, that certainly seems to be the narrative that's being pushed by uh, proponents of the coup in Egypt mm -hmm. and, and you know people who are part of um, trying to legitimize you know the events of last uh, year mm -hmm. and the um, you know, the bringing to power of Sisi, and of mm -hmm. course this, this continues to be a very dominant narrative. Mm -hmm. um, the only inconvenience for them is the fact that we don't have any actual facts to mm -hmm. demonstrate any of this. I mean, most of the violent acts that have, that have occurred uh, within Egypt, most of them are concentrated in Sinai, but even mm -hmm. those that are within the kind of other mm -hmm. urban centers in Cairo and elsewhere, mm -hmm. um, have never been proven to be linked in any way to the Muslim Brotherhood right. as an organization, or even to uh, individuals who mm -hmm. are at one point or may continue to have some kind of connections to the organization. Mm -hmm. And I think this speaks to a much broader issue, which is the fact that the, the Muslim Brotherhood, as it exists in its current mm -hmm. state, especially when we start talking about the, the youth of the organization mm -hmm. we were just dealing with previously, um, were not kind of a cultured or educated with this kind of language of violent resistance or mm -hmm. militant action of any kind, right. not in the same way that we see you know, many, many decades ago, because right. that was the narrative and that was the kind of um, acculturation that took yeah. place within a post-colonial or, or right. colonial moment. Yeah. Um, within a kind of period of occupation, for yeah. instance, within Egypt. So, yeah. so those are the kinds of things that would engender that in a yeah. way that if you look at the curriculum of the organization, if you look at the, the, the way that people are socialized into yeah. the Muslim Brotherhood, yeah. um, that there's, there's no mention of that whatsoever. Right. And so therefore, there's, there isn't even really the possibility there. Yeah. Um, and for one to kind of go down that path, they would actually have to be rejecting every single thing yeah. that the Muslim Brotherhood stands yeah. for, from the, you know, the most right. basic curriculum, right. through the kind of teachings, but also through the, the kinds of um, plans of action, right. as it were. Yeah. Um, and not to say that that's not possible. I mean, right. you do see people who become completely disillusioned. And yeah. in fact, one of the things that we've seen is that the rhetoric that comes out of mm -hmm. the more militant Islamist groups, ISIS and others, mm -hmm. um, largely deals with their critique of the Muslim Brotherhood. Right. Um, and in fact, yeah. they see it as, as kind of the biggest threat. And so yeah. these are two very kind of opposing yeah. worldviews in terms yeah. of the nature of, of Islam yeah. and politics. Yeah. Um, how, would, how would one sort of justify a sort of a commitment to, you know, formal politics, nonviolent politics in the midst of severe state repression? I mean, if you were just a young person in Egypt, 
-hmm. forget whether you were a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, it would seem much more convincing and rational to sort of side with a more militant option, given the fact that all the doors for peaceful political change have, clo have been closed. If I was a young person in Egypt, I think it would make perfect sense that you would be very radicalized by the experience since 2011, particularly since 2013. Um, and, and that, you know, this is one of the ironies of the, I think of those people in the West, in the State Department, who supported the coup. Mm -hmm. They think this coup is sort of perhaps a stabilizing, you know, element for Egyptian society. But all the evidence that we have from the past is that this is going to deepen radicalization and militancy for just obvious reasons, because there's no alternative nonviolent option that exists. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Well, I think that it's, it's one of those things that's a little too early to tell. Right. I think certainly in the current state of things, uh, that the CC regime is very, very determined to mm -hmm. snuff out any possibility for any kind of popular mobilization mm -hmm. in a peaceful way. That hasn't stopped it from happening, and that's one of the interesting things, is the mm -hmm. fact that we still continue to see weekly protests yeah. within the universities specifically, mm -hmm. which means that the youth are the, are the ones that are far more likely to mobilize in a nonviolent fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what needs to happen is there needs to be a bigger critical mass of people mm -hmm. Um, that, that spans ideologies, that spans mm -hmm. different segments of Egyptian society. And mm -hmm. that's in, in terms of the same kind of revolutionary coalition mm -hmm. that we saw in the very early stages mm -hmm. um, of the anti-Mubarak protest. In the current conditions, that's not possible, that's true. Uh, but it's not to say that over time these kinds of things won't be possible. I mean, we're already hearing about the discontent with, with the lack of security in Egypt. That was the thing that Sisi came to do, is he wanted to stabilize the economy, mm -hmm. stabilize the security situation. Mm -hmm. He's failed miserably at both. And, and we haven't seen the kinds of things that people were demanding when they signed up for the coup, at least mm -hmm. those who willingly kind of walked into this. Uh, and as a result, I think that you could start to see a broader coalition develop in time mm -hmm. um, that would try to demand some kind of um, uh, nonviolent change, mm -hmm. um, changes to the regime. But I certainly don't see that there's any avenues for formal political participation right. at this stage, but it doesn't mean that there is not yeah. for nonviolent uh, protest movements to continue to try to, to coalesce. Great. Okay. Well, thank you for your time. Thanks a lot. Thank Take you. Care.